session, and we'll, be, we'll let the others come in and join us. Um, so you're going to be very glad you're in here for this session. We talk a lot about, you know, are we running in place? How do we move forward? We've got some um, industry veterans here who uh, have been through a lot of the hard races and have some perspectives and insight to share, and they're here to dialogue with one another and also with you this afternoon. I'm very honored to have um, as our moderator and to introduce to you Anne Bryant. Good afternoon. Uh, I don't quite know, I was thinking about from the last panel how I could transition from really in the trenches folks who have some extraordinary stories that they shared with us to maybe an even higher level perspective when you look at Chris Minnick who's really been uh, instrumental in developing the Common Core standards at, at CCSSO and then Jean-Claude who um, is, has an extraordinary perspective on the industry. So I'm just going to say this session, I have no idea where it's going to go, and I have a feeling it's going to raise more questions than it answers. But I'm going to first introduce Chris and Jean-Claude, then make a few comments, share a video that will probably say what I was going to tell you better than I possibly could, and then turn it to them. So first, Chris Minnick is the... Um, Executive Director of the Council of Chief State School Officers. He's been there since 2008, and he clearly demonstrated his knowledge of accountability and um, the whole uh, assessment arena. But I think what separated him out and why he became the Executive Director when Gene left, when Gene Wilhoy left, was he has an extraordinary ability to work with 50 different, very different Chief State School Officers in the development of and now the implementation of the Common Core Standards. And he's got a background that has, is full of assessment and knowledge about that field. Uh, he worked at Harcourt for a while, and I think it's going to be really interesting because several panels and even Karen this morning have talked about the importance of the Common Core. So this is your chance to really get to the mics and nail them. And then following, <laughs> following Chris will be Jean-Claude Brizard, who is the senior advisor at the College Board. And when we had our conversation, he told me that in this current position as senior advisor of the College Board, he gets to think and talk about stuff. And from what I can tell, he knows a lot about stuff because he served as the chief executive of the Chicago Public Schools. He was the superintendent in Rochester, uh, as well as 21 years working with the New York Public Schools. He's a fellow at the Broad Center and is part of Aspen Institute's Global Leadership Network. These are two really smart guys, so don't let them get away with a thing. Um, I'm going to make just a few comments, and then each of uh, these gentlemen are going to talk for about seven or eight minutes, and then we really do want you to come to, the, come to the mics and converse with us. So as Vicki said, the title of this session is Running in Place, Problems One, Solution Zero. It gave me cause. I didn't create the title. Um, and I get its paradox, but I actually don't like it because there are lots of solutions out there. In fact, we've been hearing about many of them, but there is the problem of many solutions, but maybe not systemically at the level we all want them. Because we do know that we have an issue across this country where there is demographic, socioeconomic, geographic, real disparity in what our children are getting in their education system. And one of our greatest challenges is we have very unequal teaching and learning across, even among schools in school districts. And we have not only college-ready standards that we've got to get to, but the jobs that are going to create the kind of wages that will support a family take high-level skills. And that's why you're here, and that's some of the products that you're developing. Because the tools we have, every kind of personal device, uh, classroom, uh, technology tools are fantastic, but they are just tools. And they aren't, in every case, getting us to that level of teaching and learning that is truly changing the way learning is happening and creating the kind of expertise in our graduates that make them ready for college. I was interested in, I think it was Karen who said, or, or Diane who said, the statistic that 40% of our graduates, our high school graduates, who go to community college take remedial courses. Some say it's 50%. That's not acceptable. So as, as work, having worked with school board members for almost 17 years, I will tell you that 
school boards and superintendents, the greatest challenge is how do we, across the board, bring this teaching and learning experience to the level we need. We need. The devices, the personal devices, the, the technology can't just, the discussion used to be, should we allow them in school? And in some districts, I have to tell you, that's still a discussion. Breaks my heart, it's still a discussion. So it's not an issue of allowing them, it's encouraging them and in fact, providing them. But none of the tools will make any difference at all if teachers aren't comfortable and innovative and creative in how they use them. And the comment that was made, I'm not in the, t in the colleges of teacher education bashing because there are a lot of great courses and schools of ed out there. But we really do need to help teachers learn better how to use these tools. When we analyze the kind of time given to professional development in this country as compared to other advanced nations, there's a reason why we're behind. And when you analyze what really strong school districts are doing who have integrated these tools, the time for teacher professional development is there. Sometimes it's compensated and sometimes it is not. And that's an issue that we've got to address. Because I would argue that when teachers are really turned on, the issue of whether I'm compensated for this time fades away. So content used to be king. And long ago, the SAT and the ACT and the AP courses uh, were all about content. And now they are beginning, because of Common Core and because of the alignment, they're really beginning to look at assessing the skills of students. So writing coherently and persuasively, thinking through and solving problems, hypothesizing, extrapolating. In short, college exams, college entrance exams, will and are already testing process and skill sets, not just the order of the American presidents. So how do we move from problems one to solutions 13,800, the number of school districts there are? And how do we ramp up teaching and learning so that 100% of our students are at least at that basic level and that there are millions at the proficient and above proficiency level? And even more importantly, how do we create, as Diane was just saying, the kind of assessment systems that are truly there for teachers to use and students to use every day, not one test a year, but assessment systems that are truly integrated with curriculum and instruction. So we're using assessment to change the way teachers teach each student. So how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna ramp it up? Uh, it will not happen by the federal government imposing rules and regulations. Sorry, but not even Secretary Arne Duncan, as good as he may be, is actually going to change the performance of poorly performing schools. And state legislators, though some governors and some state legislatures would like to think they're in the business of micromanaging education, they aren't gonna change it either. The way it's gonna change is through school board, superintendent, innovative principals, and teachers who really wanna make a difference. Almost three decades ago, the National School Boards Association launched our Technology Plus Learning Conference. Do any of you remember the T plus L conference? Several hands have gone up. Um, and we also showcased Technology Leadership Network Districts, TLN Districts. This was a program that was, um, was extraordinary and still is, and my colleague Ann Flynn should be out there. Ann, are you out there? Because she was the innovator and developer of this and still is at NSBA. But more recently, what we realized was that principals and teachers and technology staff came to this conference, but school board members didn't to a high degree. So we stopped that conference and brought some of the content of the T plus L conference into our national program and our annual conference so that school boards could be helped to understand a lot of what you're doing and the strategies to turn around school districts. And over the past few decades, we've done uh, and continue to do site visits with these leadership districts. And we do four, three or four a year, hundreds of teachers, principals, superintendents, we welcome you, come for three days and learn from their colleagues about what it truly takes to turn around a district and integrate technology so that teaching and learning is what we've been talking about all morning. So the, this last year we visited districts Miami-Dade and their iPrep Academy, the Autistic Academy for Preschoolers, I'm not kidding you, Autistic Academy for Preschoolers. And if it wasn't for the technology, that wouldn't exist. 
Minnetonka, Minnesota, Colorado Springs, District 11, Klein ISD, East Penn, Pennsylvania, which is tiny, poor, and rural. If they can do it in East Penn, anyone can do it. And Vail in Tucson, Arizona, where they opened Empire High School 10 years ago with no textbooks. These are the kinds of innovative leaders that the site visits showcase. All student-centered, all focused on 21st century learning, and all transforming the way teaching and learning is happening. So I can invite all of you to come to all of these districts, although you're welcome to come to the 2014. But I brought a video which kind of captures one piece of what happens when you pull together the technology and uh, the learning to really revolutionize teaching and learning. And it's Vancouver, Oregon. So Colleen, could you roll that? Things are different here at iTech Prep. The school is split into two campuses. The middle schoolers study here at the Jim Parsley Center, while our high school students study at Wazoo, Vancouver. But it's not just a difference about where students study, it's about how they learn differently. When school began in September, students at Vancouver iTech Preparatory knew what they had signed up to study. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. But that's about it. I did not know what to expect when the school year began. I didn't feel like, like I had like no idea. What they discovered was that iTech Prep is unlike any school they had ever attended. Students use project-based learning. Yeah, project-based learning, it's just taught me so much, and I think it's a better way of learning. Teachers assign projects based around a theme. Whether it's science, math, English, or art, students learn their lessons by creating something, rather than just by lectures or memorization. Like, for example, Sustainability Summit. Well, what we decided to do was create a huge creation that we put a lot of learning in that was also having fun creating a project. And so that helped me learn stuff better than I do. Letting students have a say in what the projects look like forces them to think critically. Like you have to be dedicated and want to learn and um, want to do the project-based learning um, and open to new ideas. Helping the students along is a one-to-one -one laptop that extends the school day. That's just great. It's making it easier to learn because we can create presentations on our computers and we can um, research. The ultimate goal is to prepare students for college, careers, and life. I want to be a nurse when I grow up. I want to be an engineer and it bases off technology, science, mathematics, and engineering. So I really wanted to come to this school because it would give me a big boost on doing my, my life job. At the end of the year, students left iTech Prep confident in what they had learned, a big 180 from the uncertainty they may have felt in September. I was like pleasantly surprised that it went well. I felt like the teachers were really good and we, I learned a lot this year. iTech Prep began as a school for 6th, 7th, and 9th grade students, but over the next several years will expand to a full school for 6th through 12th graders. For In the Know, I'm Mark Ray. So project-based learning is just one tiny example, but you heard the words. You heard the budding engineer talk about his future. Uh, you also talk, you heard great teaching come out of their mouths. You saw students in charge of learning. And I think what you were beginning to see is what we're going to talk about now next, and that is some of the skills embedded in the Common Core. So Chris, tell us what's happening at the Council of Chief State School Officers and with Common Core. Um, so everybody's heard of this Common Core thing, right? We, um, we started um, a conversation back in 2009 in which we felt like the country's expectations varied pretty widely. Uh, we saw from a state like Massachusetts who had pretty high expectations for their children to, uh, to other states who didn't. And uh, we began a conversation about writing educational standards which traditionally hadn't been that controversial, right? I worked in the Oregon Department of Education, part of adopting standards. We tried to get coverage in the media and nobody would cover it. Um, it's a little different than what's going on with Common Core right now. Uh, we're, the opposite's taking place. We're trying to implement the standards and everybody's covering the politics of it, which I'd be happy to talk about, but it's not as exciting as uh, raising expectations for children across the country. So in, in, um, since that point, we, uh, we asked uh, school superintendents and governors to come together and write these standards together. 
uh, we thought we would have between 10 and 15 states participate. When we had 48 states sign up, that's when we knew we were in real trouble. We, uh, we had to find a way to get through this process where we would have 48 states stay with us through the process. And, um, and we went through about a two-year process of writing the standards in which we got to a situation now where we have 45 states that are using these standards. So that's sort of the baseline knowledge about it. I think it's become, um, it's become very political since then. And uh, again, as I said, I'd be happy to talk about the politics. But I do think this is a great example for the country of what we can do if we do work together as state agencies, as districts, um, as teachers. We have set the threshold now for all of the products that are produced in this room to be aligned to. Um, uh, companies don't have to do uh, work with a product 50 different times now. These were some of our main goals as we were stepping into this conversation. I also uh, I, I do want to focus on leadership for a second as well, because one of the challenges in this session is what works and what doesn't, and especially as you're talking with district leaders and state leaders about your work, I think leadership is the reason why something fails or succeeds, especially in the ed tech space. I think if, you are, uh, if you're willing to go into any situation, whether or not leadership is strong or not, I believe your products will be questioned in certain situations, whether or not they should be. Um, I've been sitting on the, the other side when I was with Harcourt and Pearson, when we decided to bid on something and we knew the leadership wasn't there to sustain this, we won it and then they blamed us for everything. I know that's probably never happened to you, but um, it, it's definitely something that we are looking at at the state level is how do we sustain leadership through transitions? Uh, we're gonna have 35 governor's elections next year in November. Uh, so that means, you know, so we may have some reelected, but there will be a large number of new governors. So how do we in this process sustain the change we've been able to make with the Common Core Standards through uh, transition and leadership? Um, you touched on teacher prep, and I just want to, um, I'm probably not as bullish on the colleges of education as you are. Um, I think we've failed children across the country who wanted to be teachers, generally. I think uh, there are some very good colleges of education. However, there are way too many that aren't preparing teachers for what, uh, what they expect when they get into the classroom. So I think that's an area where we have to do some work, especially at the state policy level. Um, people shouldn't be allowed to go through a program, graduate, have spent four years of their life and their money, um, or five years in most places, and then be told, well, they're either not able to teach or they're evaluated out near the bottom of the teachers, and then they're asked to do something else. I think this is a real challenge for us as a country. I think we're being unfair to a lot of those teachers as they're entering the profession. And then finally, I, I, I watch videos like that and I'm frustrated at the isolated nature of it. I, I think I wanna come to one of these conference one time and have it not be the exception, but be the reality in every state across this country. So whatever state agencies are doing to create the conditions for districts to innovate in that way, we need to focus on that and we need to push on that. Um, I, I think there are state policies that are uh, not very helpful when we talk about that type of learning, such as graduation requirements in most states that require a set no, uh, number of years in certain subjects. If a student can prove that they know this material, why are we making them sit through four years of a subject? That's not, it's not relevant for the student and it's certainly not helpful to a system that's trying to do more with less. So those are the big things that I think are really important as we talk about what's working and what's not. And, and your assessments, uh, I think, can really move us beyond some of those state policies that are absolutely 19th century or maybe 18th century. I think that's right. I mean, I think the assessment work is, is difficult. Uh, we have the two groups of states working together on those assessments, but I think they're, they're really important. Uh, we have seen, and both groups have released example items and they're very different than, than what's in current state assessment right now. So I think that's progress, but I do think that it's gonna get harder before it gets easier around this. The politics will be difficult. And we'll get to the politics later, but Jean-Claude, I was so impressed during our brief phone conversation about your experience and perspective. So what do you see as some of the problems and oh please, what are the solutions? So let me, let me um, go back a bit. Um, I struggle with how I would actually open this 
the next seven or eight minutes. One of the wonderful things about being a, I guess, recovering school superintendent is that you get time to actually read, to actually go out and talk to people and, and visit. Um, I'm more hopeful now than I was, uh, say, three or four years ago, about the future of education in this country. Um, this past July, I had a panel at the Aspen Institute to talk about the future of U.S. education. Um, John Daisy from L.A., uh, Lillian Laurie, and Kimmy Anderson from Newark. Um, and we talked very openly about the challenges facing us and the solutions that we see coming as well in the next, say, 10, 20 years. Um, and frankly, I think all of us came off this panel a bit more hopeful, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, I've been reading a lot of Michael Barber, um, now Pearson, and there are two great essays he's published in the last year, year and a half. Um, the last one was called An Avalanche is Coming, and if, the one thing you don't do, an avalanche is coming, is stand still. Um, but the first one really was the most intriguing one, what well, was called Oceans of Innovation. It talks about really what's happening across the world. And one of the lines in, in the essay was, I think the second half of the 21st century would be fantastic if we get through the first half. <laughs> uh, there's a lot going on now, Common Core, et cetera, around education. Lots of polarizing discussions, rhetoric, arguments, et cetera. If we get through this phase, I think wonderful things are coming. Uh, one of the things that I think that plagues us as, as a system is that many of us tend to be incrementalist. Um, we celebrate 1.5% gains in math and literacy when the kids are 30% proficiency. And of course, that definition we know is not really good anymore. So it takes about what, another 50 years, maybe we'll get to 90%. Uh, none of us have that kind, uh, that kind of time. So somehow, we've got to move faster. And the big question is, how do we accelerate? And I'll tell you why I am hopeful in the um, in, 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 uh, next few, few uh, statements. One is that for the first time, we're beginning to focus not just on the bottom third or the bottom 50%. We're beginning to take a look at all of the kids. So we've done a lot of work in the last, say, 10 years in closing gaps in the below basic or basic category. If you take a look at white students, black kids, Hispanic students, we're closing that gap in the bottom uh, proficiencies. We're not doing so well at the top. In fact, one of the things we found at the College Board is that we are closing the opportunity gap. We're not closing the success gap. Uh, let me qualify that. We have doubled the number of kids taking AP uh, advanced placement across the country. Um, we have increased the number of African-American kids taking AP by like almost 200%. Yet when you take a look at three, those who get threes, fours, and fives, those gaps have been increasing in the last 10 years. So more kids are sitting, which is something to celebrate, but they're not getting the scores that we want them to get. And the big question, frankly, is how do we move to, to accelerate? Let me tell you why we have to accelerate and why we cannot be incrementalists. Um, when you take a look at what's happening in this world, and as many of you guys are, are, are technologists and you see that and you know it, uh, and the, advice, the executive chairman of Google said most recently that every two days we create as much content as we did from the dawn of civilization to 2003, every two days now. So when you look at content, uh, just teaching what we've taught in the past is insufficient. We're not going to get kids to be able to, to uh, embrace the world that they, that, they, that they have to engage. So somehow, we have to focus on the layer above content. Uh, I am not saying that content knowledge is unimportant. It is important. But the big question that we're asking now is, of course, how do you get kids to create new knowledge from existing content? Uh, what some call the non-cognitive skills, a term, frankly, I do not frankly think is right, because some of those skills are metacognitive skills, um, and many more cognitive skills. When you think about extrapolation, synthesis, what, what do you do with information? In today's corporate world, what you tend to find are three, four, five, ten people around a whiteboard arguing around a particular topic or, or issue. How do you get kids, especially kids who are underrepresented, poor kids, to be able to access that kind of world? That, for me, is what Common Core talks about. That, for me, is what, what we ought to be doing in our schools. It's not something we teach separately, but something we do in concert with math, literacy, science, etc. So why am I hopeful? Because for the first time, the word coherence is appearing in our conversation. I'm beginning to watch people make connections between uh, standards, curriculum, and by the way, uh, lots of work around structural reforms in the last 10 years. So even the reform movement as is, is evolving and, and, and maturing and talking about what happens between teachers, students, and, and curricular materials. So that relationship, I think, is, is morphing and changing in a way that's coherent. 
I'm sure you're saying, well, yeah, we've talked about this before. But yes, but not in, in the sense where um, um, sort of next-gen standards, talk to next-gen curricula, talk to uh, everywhere learning, uh, talk to access to information in a way that's sexy, in, in a way that gets kids excited about what they're looking and studying. My three-and-a-half-year-old has been proficient on an iPad since he was 18 months. And what he does with technology is fascinating much more than I did when I was 15, 16 years of age. So when you take a look at data, curriculum, assessment, intervention, uh, and, and sort of encasing a structure of changing what we do in schools around time to teach, around how we train teachers, the fact that a school day, this agrarian calendar doesn't work. So all of the talk around structural reform now is encased in this real meaty stuff that we know is the most important thing in our schools makes me very hopeful. So for the first time, I see a level of coherence in conversation that I have not seen uh, before. Uh, when we talk about the how to teach, what to teach, time to teach, all of this is coming in, in, in a way that makes a lot of sense to us. And now we're also be beginning to bridge the ideas that when a kid comes to school and they're poor, the, what you hear the antagonists talk about, poor kids can't learn, there are now organizations like Turning Out for Children who are saying, yes, we know that's an issue, but let's fix that. Let's get these kids ready to learn and then teach them. Don't say we can't do that. So for the first time, everyone's coming together in a way that really is coherent and really would propel us, perhaps, to the acceleration that we're looking for. Wow. Okay. So, uh, Chris, you said state chiefs, 48 states came together to develop these Common Core. Uh, Jean-Claude, you are talking about how this level of Common Core standards is really the way we have to go. I think, I think most people in this room agree with that. But out there in the world, there are politics and they're getting messy. Um, this last week, Politico published a pretty blistering article and labeled it the Common Core Money War. And what that Politico article did was talk about the $160 million that the Gates Foundation is putting in to promote the Common Core. Um, CEOs are lining up to promote the Common Core. And yet we've got um, the opposite side and the right wing. And on that side are the Pope, DeVos, Scaife families, um, Checker Finn, the head of the Thomas Fordham Foundation, who's pro Common Core, said, the proponents of the standards were lulled into thinking this was a no-brainer. Now it's war. What's your perspective on that? I don't want to be on the other side of the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'll lose that one. Um, but at the same time, um, my perspective on, on the politics conversation is, I, I mean, I think Checker's partly right in his quote. Uh, we did feel like this was something that just made sense for the country. At the time we started it, there was no politics because the federal government hadn't offered up money for anybody to do race to the top at that point. Um, there were no conversations about how we would assess these standards at that point. So uh, when you had 48 states sitting together, they said, of course, why wouldn't you want the same standards from state to state? That makes sense. So I do think, though, uh, despite the fact the politics are going uh, are gonna to play out over the next couple of years, I've been amazed to see the way teachers have stepped up in favor of these standards in a way that hasn't taken place uh, in the past 15 years around standards-based reform. Uh, both of the unions and uh, even just individual teachers coming to, to uh, testify on behalf of the standards. Um, another article that, will, that was written uh, talked about the hearings in Tennessee uh, this past week. Actually, it might have been this week. I don't remember now. But, um, oh, it was last week. And they, they talked about how many people from Tennessee were testifying for the standards and that all of the folks that were testifying against the standards were from out of, outside of Tennessee. Um, I found that to be pretty interesting uh, given the perspective of the, uh, the, the people who are against this saying that it was federally driven and, and all that. So I, I think working our way through the politics of this is going to be really, really um, interesting if you're a political scientist. I think the, uh, the standards, I do believe, will hold in most places. I don't think uh, there will be much, put, uh, much drawback on that because it just makes sense to have a set of standards across this country while states are still in control of what they do with these standards. So the assessment conversation will be a little bit more difficult because states will be spending 
significant amounts of money to deliver those assessments. That's where I believe the politics will become even uh, more difficult as we move forward. So, you know, the, the, the one-line summary is, you know, I think we're in a good place with the standards. I, I don't see any, uh, while, while there is pushback, I don't see any cracks in that armor. I do think the assessment conversation is one that we're going to have to monitor. So assessments, as you know, they're the two big consortia, Park and Smarter Balances, along with several others. Um, but they got the big money. They got the 300 million, I think it was, each. Um, so rumor has it, uh, Jean-Claude, that the college board is thinking about getting into the assessment business. What, what's the scoop there? Well, um, yeah, I think, I think the Putting you on the spot. <laughs> the rumors are true. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the wonderful things about our new president, the college board, is that not only does he get what we have to do to propel our nation forward, uh, but he also gets the, 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 uh, the implementation work that we need to do as well um, to make sure that we are successful. So in, in taking through what we have been doing for the last 100 years with SAT um, and getting kids into college, the, the changing discussion, frankly, has been about not just entry anymore. Can we create a package of assessments and supports, et cetera, for schools, uh, for kids that will get them to persist um, um, in, in, in college? And in my current, half of my job right now is focusing on defining career readiness and see how we can even implement some of this stuff in a way that makes sense to kids in school, middle through, through college. And one of the questions we're pushing, and being, being even more bold, not to say we're going to go there, frankly, but all of us go to work at the end of school, wherever that exit ramp is. Um, can we even guarantee success in the first job post-college or post-school? Think about the skills needed to succeed. Again. Not all about content, but the skills we know kids, young people need to really do well. What one of my colleagues at Europe said, um, getting access to a W-2 that will continue to increase over your lifetime. Um, so can you do that in a way that's meaningful to young people? And what can we do from middle school all the way up through college so they are successful? Are the ways in which we're thinking about everything that we do from advocacy to assessments um, in a way that's meaningful for middle schoolers all the way up through college? And so please go to the mics uh, if you want to take on one of these wonderful individuals. Um, and let me just also say that a lot of conversation has been going on before this panel about multiple assessments. Having the Common Core is good, but the cry here has been from uh, Diane in the last session to others, we've, we've got to have from the community, from the technology community, the tools that we need so that each child, each moment, we can get the right kind of feedback both to that child and to the teacher. Yes, sir. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Kwesi Sari, our recovering consultant and ed reformer. Um, so I saw the title of this session was Problems One, uh, Solution Zero. So I figure I've come to the right place looking for answers. And if not, I'm happy to go back to the Oracle looking for better solutions. Um, it, it dawns on me that. Um, in the public sector, uh, we've got a challenge around incentives and opportunities. And what I mean by that is in the private sector, uh, we're rewarded and encouraged actually to fail. And in fact, if you're in the right context, Silicon Valley, um, you're encouraged to fail. And in fact, you're rewarded if you've got a good story to tell about your failures versus your successes. Uh, and the inverse is true actually in the public sector. And in fact, the economics and the incentives actually work to make sure you stay the course and the fear of the downside actually outweighs the opportunity on the upside. Uh, so my question for the panel is, how do we actually create environments where in the public sector we actually get the reverse of what's going on? How do you actually encourage rapid failure? Uh, and how do you actually promote it? And if there are places where this is already existing, then you know, point us to that direction so we can all run there and, and be successful because the difficulty of marrying these two um, paradigms is actually quite problematic. I'll take my answers offline. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Yeah, so I think one of the hardest parts about failure is we're failing with some, somebody's kid uh, in every one of these situations. So um, I know I don't want, uh, my kid's a little younger than yours, but I hope he starts using the iPad soon enough. Um, the, uh, I just think that the hardest part about this is we have to find ways for safe failure where children can have time to recover if we didn't do it quite right for them. So, you know, if there's a seventh grade math uh, type of conversation where students are all starting from that same level, then we can have a conversation about 
okay, well, if we didn't get it quite right in seventh grade, we can, we can pick up in eighth grade and, and, and fix that failure, to use, to use your language. I don't think we do that very well. I think right now we ignore failure and we pass kids on. And then by the time they're you know, three or four grades behind in their learning, then we're saying, well, the teacher's saying, well, how do I even teach this kid? Well, I gotta go back to, to, to fifth or sixth grade. I, I just think we have to be harder on the process of students moving through the system so we can't let kids get way ahead of where they're actually performing. And I think we also need to make sure that the, the, um, the, the progress that we're making in these settings is documented and that we're, like you said, I don't know exactly where this is happening. There's successes in the EdTech network. There's successes in our innovation lab network at CCSSO. But there's successes on this video that we just showed. But that's not wide, uh, widely scaled as of, uh, as of yet. And I, I still think that there are policies that are getting in the way of us scaling. And they mostly, uh, the funding would be one major one. So if we really wanted to incentivize um, trying new things, I won't say failing, um, I think we got to take on how we fund schools nationwide. Um, and that's even harder than Common Core standards. <laughs> just, just to add to, to, to what Chris just said, the, the idea of safe failures. I mean, no one would want airplanes crashing so you can learn from, from the other we do quite a bit, right? Uh, I think the solution, frankly, in, in the safe failure is that we need data points, sort of formative data points all along the way so we can intervene and, and stop if we see things going south. We don't do that well in education. We have an information gap, right? We do, uh, so recently we did autopsies. If the fourth grade class failed, 70% failed, oh well, they went down in fifth grade, and we move on. So if we can find a way in, in, in our implementation uh, to have a way of, 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 of documenting and measuring quickly and, 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 and in an ag agile way so you don't allow for a kid to fail after two or three years, you realize the treatment has not been, has not been working, that would be wonderful. I mean, Jim Shelton often says that we spend a fraction of a fraction of, of monies in research and education. Um, we don't do that. In, in the academic world, uh, we have folks doing tons of research, much of it is on bookshelves or in some library somewhere. It doesn't make its way to the practitioner. If we can find a way to create that kind of sort of stops along the way, um, we can have the safe failures and be, be, be much more willing to innovate. Can I ask you, how did you think you did in Chicago with that? I mean, generally. Oh, no, I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the idea of big school systems are not agile enough to actually yeah. do that. Okay. No, we yeah. don't have the infrastructure, don't have the data. Uh, much of what we got was after the fact. Yeah. Um, does it exist? And I would also just um, add that it's, it is about children and failing and risking, but it's also about the adults in the system. We have a system that doesn't allow teachers to collaborate across yeah. the entire spectrum, whether it's grades or subject matter, to look at experimentation of teaching practice and then trying it and then having them coach each other. Yeah. We need a lot more of that. So that's a, an, another aspect of that. Yes, are you? Yeah, this is a little bit related to measurement of success. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how this whole move toward common court standards and individualized learning may affect the way we hold schools accountable, may, may affect the way we measure school accountability moving forward. There's a lot of talk about how all of this can uh, impact low performing schools and I think um, that's great, but for example, I've, I'm very fortunate in that I was able to search out high school districts and high schools at the time that my daughter enrolled. And I enrolled her in a school that is very highly ranked in the state of California. And I was shocked to realize that she's still going in and spending the majority of her day madly scribbling down notes while someone stands in front of the classroom and, you know, basically drones on and on. So, <laughs> and this school is highly, highly ranked. So I'm wondering if there's going to be a way that we change the way we measure school accountability and success to account for more innovation? A huge question. So first, first of all, I think the scorecard is completely wrong. Uh, the way we measure is, is completely wrong. We have maybe one, two data points, maybe three data points. We, we, we don't have the information. Um, my wife is an educator as well, and whenever we move into a city in Chicago and, and now in, in Washington, D.C., before we put our kid in the school, we visit. We, don't, we look at the math in ELA scores, but that's one small slice of the work for us. We go in to see what's happening in that school on the ground, to see from our eyes 
if it's a place we want to put our kids in. So somehow we don't have all of the tools yet to really measure what makes a school great. Um, so that's one part. It's the information gap I was talking about. Um, two, in terms of accountability, I think one of the mistakes we've made, um, and I, although I think we had to go there first, frankly, then correct, is that we've led with accountability. Uh, I, am not, I am not a soft heart. I'm, I'm not entirely accountable. I'm really for poor accountability. But that has to be part of our fabric as an as organization, right? Not what we lead with. Um, and, and how do you support a school to get better? How do you allow folks to feel safe in terms of using the information to get better while not giving them a get out of jail free card? I think is the way in which you have to take a look at this. So somehow, uh, we're going to get there. I mean, we're muddling our way through. Um, but we're going to get there as well, too. Chris, do you I'd just add, add that we have to add more, uh, more metrics to this conversation than we even think about right now. So I think we should be really aggressive, especially in high school, about success after you leave high school being one of the metrics in high school accountability. I think um, most of the assessments, uh, I was an assessment director in Oregon, uh, we found the motivation effect to be pretty high in the, in the high schools across the state, meaning the students knew that the test didn't matter. Um, and therefore didn't necessarily take it all that seriously. So um, I think we have to think of things like success after, after you leave that, the setting you're in, um, engagement metrics, if we can get those. Um, th you know, those are sort of tip of the iceberg type of metrics. Um, if you're using online learning, we should be talking about how students are performing against the goals that were set in the online space. It cannot be the same traditional uh, test scores that, um, that we had. Although I do believe, I still have yet to see a great school that didn't have high test scores. Yes. So uh, I think that's a, that's a piece that we have to figure out. Uh, use it as a floor, but not the, not the ceiling when, you come, when it comes to test scores. So. Let me just add one more layer to, to, to my answer. And Chris is absolutely correct, by the way. Um, when I first became a, a, a superintendent uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, uh, one of my mentors said to me, uh, every city has one metric by which it measures success. What is it here? Um, and I said, graduation rate. And he, he, she said to me, you can blow the place up, make sure this goes up. Then do what you want to do to serve kids. So in the public eye, we had to make sure that number kept increasing while we went out and did everything else on suspensions and everything else to begin to right-size the ship, if that makes sense. Begin to focus on social emotional learning, uh, positive behaviors, everything else we had to do to move the system to help kids. But that number is what the papers cared about. I had to make sure that number went up. And Chris is right. As we did the other stuff, guess what? It was a natural gain to watch the numbers go up in graduation rate. And we have to be careful that graduation rate, you track them in college or vocational or post-secondary or jobs to find out whether that was a false or a real graduation. I mean, the remediation factor is terrible. And I would just add something that you mentioned. I think a real measure of success of a school is the climate. And you can measure climate. You can talk to kids. You can survey them. You can talk to teachers. But the whole sort of character development of a school, I think, is terribly important. People talk about bullying policies and bullying programs. Well, I got to tell you, if you have good character and culture in a school, it's not an issue. The kids take care of it. But the, but the public only cares about when the climate is bad. Mm -hmm. So when it's good, no one pays attention. When it's bad, everyone pays attention. But, but that's what ends up to be correct, um, that for, for, for teachers to be able to teach, you need to have a good climate. So the rest will take care of itself if you do the prerequisites. The problem is the public only wants to see the math or literacy or graduation rate, et cetera. We all know that persistence beyond high school is really what matters uh, in schools, but no one tracks that, frankly. Yeah, I also think it's just a terrible cycle. I mean, you can probably speak to this better than I can, but just when a district takes action against schools, what's the first thing you see in the news? You see all the parents complaining that they're closing their neighborhood school. And I, you know, I've looked at some of the data on some of these schools they're closing, and it's atrocious. And, I mean, and, and then we sit here and say, well, we should, yeah, we should be taking action against these schools, but then the media plays up all these parents who are unhappy that their school down the street's closing, and their kid's gonna have to you know, get on a bus and go five minutes to another school. Um, I just, uh, we've gotta push through these conversations because kids should not be in the, some of those settings, and they continue to be mostly because we just don't have the, the backbone to go through those political conversations. And Chris talks about leadership, and even in this case, too. 
you may have a, 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 a school leader, a super, super, superintendent is bold, wants to do the right thing. If that individual is not flanked by the right kind of political support, I mean, I mean we all have to live, and make a living and pay our, pay our mortgages. And my contract is, is holding on these folks who are hiring me at a school board. Um, and if I don't make their lives a little easier, give them gains, I'm gonna lose my job. So you get this sort of cyclical effect that we have to pay attention to and understand to help those folks who are making those really courageous kinds of, of decisions to help, to help young people. Okay, so this is, oh, Sorry, did you have just another? a quick follow on I wanted yeah. to say. So how do we fix this from the grassroots? I mean, how do parents put the kind of pressure on their schools to make this happen? Do I need to like run for school board or <laughs> is there a way to do it? Yeah. Run for the school board. Well, yeah. <laughs> well school board is a, is a good way to do it. Uh, for me, I'm actually not, uh, when I put my child in school, I'm not sure we're gonna move. Uh, I think you have a dilemma as a parent. And actually Mike Petrilli's book is quite good on this. If you haven't seen it, it's called The Diverse Schools Dilemma. Yes. And he chronicles his decision to move to, uh, out of D.C. into a suburb of D.C. because of where his, he's going to send his child to school. And I think, um, uh, for me at least, I want to be in a setting where um, I know that my child will be in a situation where there's more than just high performers in, in this school. So I guess I want to push on uh, all of us I think it's a societal issue more than it is anything that we all, you know, where we live is where we, you know, is the community we think uh, is around us is the same set of people we go to school with usually. So if we're going to take this seriously, I, I hate to say it, I think it goes back to funding. And we fund property taxes. Most of our schools are funded by property taxes. And so the, the, the properties that cost more, they have more, they have more money in their school district. So if we really wanted to take this on at a state level, we would have some sort of equal funding across property taxes. Uh, it's going to be really hard to do. That's where we need the policy. Well, and anyone here from Vermont? Um, pretty innovative way that they have attacked it. I mean, they've basically said, you know, if you're going to if you're going to raise foundational money, we're going to take a piece of that and put it in the poorer districts. You can raise the money, but we're going to make sure that it's equitable across the state to poorer districts. Okay, is that a person at the mic? Good afternoon. I have a question about uh, competition and uh, the kind of competition that Common Core sets up um, between schools, between families, between teachers. And one of the things that we know is that children learn from teachers who value them, who have good relationships with them, and who care about them greet them at the door, know their names, know their families, whether they're in poverty or whether they're wealthy. And so I'm wondering how the Common Core might support or assist in really creating an environment that's a safe place for kids to learn, no matter who they are and where they're from, and allowing those children to feel that connection to their learning and to their teachers in a positive way that sets them up for success. Thanks, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump first, and I'm sure Chris will have a lot more to add. Um, I think the Common Core um, is setting the stage for exactly what you're talking about. So if you think about um, the kinds of assessments that we need to really measure what is happening, and if you want to use the expression non-cognitive uh, skills, for instance, most of the time when you build this kind of platform, it can easily be gained, right? unless you have teachers observing what students do in classrooms, right? How do you measure certain kinds of non-cognitive skills? You really need someone, an adult and a child or children in, in, in sort of working in tandem. Um, for, that, for, for these new assessments really take shape well, you will have to trust teachers to do, to do it well. Does that make sense, right? right. So um, as we move to these sort of high level thinking kinds of standards, into good curriculum, and by the way, Common Core is not curriculum, let's make sure we all say that loudly. Um, as we move into writing good curriculum, good assessments, the pedagogical practices come into play um, in a way for you to be able to trust teachers and students. So accountability, we'll also see perhaps a, 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 an evolution as well in how you look at, you measure, how you measure teachers and kids and, and, and their achievement. So I think if we do this thing as well, and write good curriculum, and, and train teachers well, you're gonna get to a place where you'll have to 
to the trust. In fact, it's what makes places like Finland and other places really successful, that see the teachers are in charge. Um, and you have to have a certain level of trust, but they've got to be trained well, too, to be able to do the kind of stuff we're asking them to actually do in, in, in schools and school districts. And I would also argue that many of the companies in this room creating the kind of curriculum that are aligned to Common Core standards needs to be thinking about the, just the issue you raise, that it's not about individual competing against other individuals, either teachers or students, that we really need to create, whether it's games or programs or whatever, that, that forces a camaraderie, that forces us to work together as either a culture of learning in a school or across a district. But Chris, you were going to jump in on this. Well, I mean, I would just, I, mean, I think that ultimately that's the idea of setting clear expectations for kids, is that teachers should be independent and professional to get students to these uh, these goals. And I, you know, I talk with a lot of teachers. The most frustrated teachers I find are the ones that are over-programmed by the, either the district or the state or, mm -hmm. uh, or whoever. And that, you know, their day is laid out for them by somebody else. And um, I, I hope the Common Core will spur that type of innovation. I will also say Common Core is just a set of standards. It's not going to solve these problems unless we really commit to solving these problems, even outside of the Common Core framework. Because you could have whatever standards you want, and those problems still exist in our education system. So um, I do think that uh, we, it can be helpful in having clear expectations. It should free teachers up. But uh, at the same time, I, I think we should be doing this anyway, whether or not you have the Common Core standards or not. Thank you. Yeah. So let me just add two. You can, you can go, I'll keep talking. Just two things um, to piggyback on what you were saying. One is that um, when you look at collaborative problem solving, for instance, how do you measure individual input into something like that? I don't think we've figured that out yet, unless you have someone observing what's happening in the classroom. So if you guys can figure that out, please help us. Um, so that's one big slice. The second thing about, again, being hopeful, uh, despite the rhetoric around the Common Core, is that it has opened a dialogue about not just standards, but curriculum assessment, pedagogy, time, structure. Because you, when, you, when I hear a teacher say, or a principal say, I don't have enough time to teach these, I'm like, well, because you're trying to fit this into this box, and the box doesn't work. Why don't we rethink the entire structure at the same time to make sure, let's not, let's not, put, let's not throw out um, the good because we can't figure out how to make the light bulb screw on properly, right? Um, so we have all these, these discussions have come up because of these new standards. And for me, it's, it's a wonderful thing to hear um, high-class arguments going on. Great. Thank you so much. OK, so this room is filled with brilliant people. And they run companies and work with companies that are creating these fantastic products and services. So Chris and Jean-Claude, if you could request of them to get to your, your, your vision, Jean-Claude, or Chris, to, to help move out the, art, the vision that CCSSO has. What, what would you challenge them to do? What would be the most helpful for them to help you? Um, please read the standards. And I, I, I mean that uh, not in a pejorative way, but I'm, what I'm saying is make sure the people that work for you are actually into the content standards in a way that they deeply understand what we were talking about, that these standards are pretty significantly different than any state's current standards. And um, simply taking your current product and saying um, it's matching, it matches the Common Core um, will be a challenge. I'm not saying you can't do it, because some of you probably can show me how that would work. But I would just encourage you to dig into the standards. If you haven't, I've, uh, I'd be happy to give anybody my copy that I have right here um, if you'd like them. But uh, I, I think that the change that we're asking for in this country is big enough that we're going to need different types of teaching and different types of interaction with students. You guys are on the leading edge of that conversation. So excited that all the companies in this room are helping us do this. But uh, I would just add to make sure that they're, what they're doing is truly uh, aligned to what we're, we're, we're seeing in the standards. By the way, I just came across a great app on the, on the standards for my iPads. I've been using it a lot, so whoever did it, thank you. Uh, it's free, too, which is wonderful. Um, I would say one thing. Um, help us create more disruption. And, and, and more importantly, help us create more disruption, and I'll be using the expression, by creating an education spring. Um, let me qualify that. 
Everything we've done has been top down. We've gone to chief states, we've gone to superintendents and principals and come down. Somehow we have to, to unleash this army of teachers and parents and kids, especially kids. Have them own the data, you know, shift the power dynamic. Let the young people change the system because they will if they know how to push, if they have the right information. So somehow we think as we give schools and, and systems data and information, let's find a way to also put it in the hands of the kids, the people who are hurt or helped by it so they can push and radically change the system. They don't care about politics. Their future is at stake. That's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, can we thank our panelists for uh, some thoughtful comments? Um, three very bright, inspiring people. Thank you very much for your contribution today. Uh, we have a very short break now, a 15-minute break before the last session in here on another hot topic on big data and interoperability. Uh, we're really going to try to paint a picture of what that means down at the school level. I think you will really value uh, from being in that. If you are with one of our sponsoring companies that's exhibiting, the tables are set up, your materials are at the tables, um, and you can go next door and kind of get set up during the break. We'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>